Warning, the following message may be offensive to some audiences. These audiences may include, but are not limited to, professing Christians who never read their Bible, sissies, sodomites, men with man buns, those who approve of men with man buns, man bun enablers, white knights for men with man buns, homemakers who have finished Netflix but don't know how to meal plan, and people who refer to their pets as fur babies. Viewer discretion is advised. People are tired of hearing nothing but doom and despair on the radio. The message of Christianity is that salvation is found in Christ alone, and any who reject Christ therefore forfeit any hope of salvation, any hope of heaven. The issue is that humanity is in sin and the wrath of Almighty God is hanging over our heads. They will hear his words, they will not act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment, when the fires of wrath come, they will be consumed and they will perish. God wrapped himself in flesh, condescended, and became a man, died on the cross for sin, was resurrected on the third day, has ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he sits now to make intercession for us. Jesus is saying there is a group of people who will hear his words, they will act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment come in that final day, their house will stand. Welcome to Bible Bash, where we aim to equip the saints for the works of ministry. We're your hosts, Harrison Kerrig and Pastor Tim Mullet, and today we seek to answer the age-old question, should women who murder their unborn children be drawn and quartered? And before we ask this title question and kind of dive right into it, Tim, do you mind uh, just explaining to us what drawn and quartered actually means for, for those who might not be acquainted with this term? Yeah, I was actually looking that up, and it seems like there's some <laughs> discussion about um, what that really meant. Uh, oh, really? But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I assumed it meant you have uh, essentially a body that is um, tied between four horses, and the four horses are spurred uh, outward, and you basically split the body into four that way. And I think that's probably what it is, but then some of the other websites were basically saying that it uh, means – cutting the body into four pieces too, but, um, uh-huh. but yeah, essentially the drawn part is, um, I, I guess, you know, it's, it's essentially a cruel form of punishment that happened in, you know, the late, um, let's see, um, uh, let's see 12th century something like something along that lines. And basically you just, you know, the drawn part is that, uh, you're tied to a horse and dragged to the gallows and then you're hung and, you know, usually you're going to be disemboweled live. And then after being disemboweled, you have your entrails burned, you're normally beheaded and then you're quartered, meaning, uh, put between the four horses and have them, um, run in opposite directions. So you might want to think of the William Wallace, uh, scene and Braveheart kind of kind of deal so basically what you're saying is definitely a gentleman's death right (laughs) that's right well apparently it was a kind of death that was reserved for traitors I think that's what people agree upon yeah well I didn't I didn't know that I I just assumed it was the you know you tie you tie uh, each limb to a different horse and then you just you smack the horse on and then it yeah, runs off. Yeah, I think that's probably what it is, but I don't know. There's some dispute, but who, who hmm. knows? Yeah, it's something bad. You know, so Definitely. Cut in the four pieces somehow. Quartered, cut in the, Yeah, whatever the it is, it doesn't swords. sound pleasant. <laughs> um, sure. Okay, so, uh, so going back to the title question itself, now that we, can, we know at least somewhat what, what drawn and quartered uh, <laughs> means, uh, what do you think? Should should women who murder their unborn children be drawn and quartered? Sure. Well, uh, I think it's a it's a difficult question to ask uh, to answer, uh, and not for the reasons we think. I mean, I, I would say that um, right now it's kind of blasphemy to think that a woman should face any punishment for um, murdering her unborn child, but. Um, I think what's hard about it is if you're trying to think about it from a biblical perspective, there's several passages which seem to – several types of passages which seem to come to mind. And so you have the principle of lex uh, talionis, uh, which essentially is you know the 
principle in the Bible that the punishment should fit the crime. And so that's, uh, you know, the eye for eye, the tooth for tooth, the life for life kind of principle. And then, you know, related to individuals who are making false accusations against another person, uh, if you if you're uh, laying in wait for your brother and seeking to do them harm, and it and it uh, is found out that you know you're making a false accusation, the Israelites are told to do to the person making that false accusation what they intended to do to their brother, essentially. And so, yeah, in the old covenant law, um, there is this principle of uh, you know equal ret- retribution, essentially, that if you seek to do your brother harm, what you know the the punishment has kind of like a maximum amount of, uh, you know, if you take their uh, eye, you know, the, it, the punishment should fit crime. So an eye for an eye, a two for two, a life for a life. What you seek to do do to the other person or do to the other person, uh, that's what should be done to you. So there's there's this principle of, of that being defined as justice. And so then when you compare that to the idea of a mother mother, um, basically conscripting a abortionist or a hitman to kill her child essentially there is a kind of justice there to be thought that if you actually understand what's happening to an unborn baby in an abortion i mean they are essentially being chopped into pieces in their mother's womb while they're alive and then in order so in order that they'll uh fit you know into the birth canal without as much uh difficulty so uh, some of some of the um you know, if you look into how they do these sorts of things, I mean, there's um, it, it's a pretty grisly process as far as that goes, which involves dis, you know, often involves depending what stage it is, uh, dismembering while in the mother's womb. So then you think about, well, should she be drawn and quartered? And well, it seems to me that that would be an example of the lex talionis type, type of thing in in operation, if that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. I think what makes it difficult, though, is that there are – there's obviously a long legal tradition in our country of you know, an attempt to ban cruel and unusual punishment as far as that goes. And so there, there is kind of a, a moral intuition there that seems to be something that we should resonate with and to some degree, which is to say that um, – you know there are types of barbaric and cruel punishments for crimes that we should uh, be somewhat skeptical about um, in general because I mean there is there's a distortion of the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for life kind of principle that basically says that you know whatever a person does that needs to be done to them period without any forethought right and the problem with that kind of thing is that if you were to imagine like a person rapes someone else well. You know, a rape for a rape, is that what the Bible is intending there? Well, no, clearly not. So there's some kinds of punishments that you can't really mete out without um, being guilty of the same thing that you're doing, right? So you you can imagine some kind of punishments that it would be sinful to carry out. And then, you know, I think with something like this drawn and quartered kind of thing, this lengthy torture for the traitor kind of person – it does seem to me to that there is there are types of things like that that would stain you in the process of carrying out to where uh, while capital punishment might be a live option in the case of certain things, particularly murder. Uh, it it does seem to me that there's ways to execute um, no pun intended uh, <laughs> <laughs> punishment without being uh, stained stained morally in the process now i mean i would say that though it's even more complicated though because stoning was a (laughs) stoning in the law was a prescription given to the people right and by modern standards that would be considered cruel and unusual punishment um and you know many people attack the bible for exactly that reason essentially saying that the bible is a stone age barbaric book that it's just uh, primitive tribal violence based on an angry deity and all that kind of stuff and so then basically um, you know, if you read your Bible honestly, you have to under, you have to admit, yeah, stoning is there, and so it must be that God's ethic is a little bit different than man's at that point, and so there are some sorts of crimes so heinous that they ought to be made into a public spectacle, um, and everything else, and so modern sensibilities don't always prevail in that kind of way. But I would think, though, with the drawn and quartering issue, 
I think, well, I think a woman should obviously, a woman who, who murders her child should be put to death. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the right method, but um, I think part of the reason why I, I don't know that that's a right method is because it seems that, uh, honestly, uh, it's, you know, from a biblical perspective, I don't think it's the cruelty of the method so much that is the issue, but um, although that may be a factor, but I think it's more the contempt for the human body that would be the issue, if that makes sense. Okay. What, what do you form. mean? Well, I mean, in order to quarter someone, you have to literally rip their body apart. Yeah, you're definitely and, getting stained in that process. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it shows contempt for the image of God in a pretty high-handed and fundamental way. Meaning, like that, you know, there's a there's part part of the reason why Christians show respect for bodies even in death, and we want to bury those bodies and not just casually destroy those bodies is because there is this hope that God will raise this body in the last day in some sense, right? Mm-hmm. And so just to like mutilate the body beyond recognition or destroy it or tear it up shows contempt for God and for his design, to, his design in a pretty fundamental way. And even, you know, bodies that are fit for destruction, like they're going to, like, um, like even, even the unbeliever will be given a resurrection body, which is fit for destruction, which will have some correlation to the body on earth as far as that goes. And so I think um, there is some kind of, you know, intuition there to say, hey, yeah, let's show respect for the body in that kind of way. And it's not the kind of, like, thing that the Greeks believe, you know, if you cut the tongue out and pluck out the eyes and forever on all eternity they're going to be eyeless and tongueless or something like that. But I do think there is a kind of Christian intuition to say we have to show the, the body some more respect than that it, it, even if it deserves a good killing right so <laughs> okay so so essentially you know maybe maybe asserting that someone who gets an abortion should be drawn and quartered is a little overzealous um but <laughs> but then at the same time you know maybe maybe a rope in a tree isn't is that kind yeah, of what you're saying at, yeah I mean, hang them by the neck till the feet stop kicking yeah sure right um so (laughs) obviously uh we live in a world that really doesn't agree with what you're saying at all and and honestly (laughs) if they when people hear what you're saying they might actually be saying hey you know what let's get a rope in a tree and (laughs) and and take me out yeah yeah take you out instead because because we don't like what you're saying um you know most people in our society um even even pro life people, even people who say they're against abortion, um, will assert that the women are they're just victims in this process. They're um, we shouldn't view them as murderers the same way we would, you know, if someone plunged a knife into someone else's chest, um, we would view that person as a murderer. We shouldn't view the women who are getting abortions this way. So. So why exactly do you think uh, they should be, they should, you know, opposed to what society says, why do you think they should actually be treated as murderers in this process? I mean, nor, you know, normally it's not like they're the ones doing any uh, performing, you know, performing the action. So, so what are they, what's the reasoning behind saying, Hey, you know what? They do deserve uh, the death penalty from the you know from the government sure yeah uh, when i well that's a good uh, let's start well let me start with that qualification when we talk about should a woman uh because you live in a like an insane society that's going to misunderstand everything that you're saying you might want to just clarify that um when you're answering a question like this you're you are talking about capital punish you're talking about just capital punishment you're not yes. talking about individual vigilante justice or yes. something like that yeah and that's so, an, that's an important point we're we're not <laughs> advocating that anyone take the law into their own hand and <laughs> we don't need any batman you know, running around <laughs> no, throwing no. So throwing batarangs <laughs> they were not uh, that's not the discussion we're having you know although i'm sure that plenty of people will hear that immediately even though it's it's because at least listening comprehension problems not because of what we're saying though but um have that having that clarification what what you're saying about the pro-life movement is um right i i 
when I was in seminary, I one of my classes was an applied ministry class, and I um, part of that class is you have to do a practical kind of ministry on the ground. And I was doing nursing home chaplain ministry, and then I also uh, during that time did uh, speak for the unborn ministry. And you know, a lot of a lot of the people that were going out there were we we thought abortion was a murder and rightfully so and we were trying to speak to women who were going to get uh, get uh, abortions performed or have their child children killed essentially but we um we were doing that and it was very clear that i, I think the vast majority of people who were doing it were just looking at for it as an opportunity to have the gospel presented, but then there was a few people who were the ones who were mostly in charge of the ministry who seemed to be overzealous and committed to the, in kind of an unthinking way, to the principles of the pro life movement. And I think, you know, tied to the, the whole pro life strategy has very much been to identify the women procuring the abortions as victims. And, and so that's right. I mean, and that's, you know, we were encouraged not to try to proselytize by some of these people, and that was one of the things that we were encouraged not to do. Um, <laughs> and then, which, I mean, my goodness. Um, yeah. What do you say to that? But then, you know, part of it is there There has been a whole strategy to kind of view the women as a victim, um, victims as far as that goes, um, and to um, think of them in that kind of way. And so then the question along those lines is, why should they be culpable for their actions, uh, particularly when they're not necessarily the ones taking the coat hanger up and trying to kill the baby themselves? Is that kind of the yeah. impulse? Or um, Well, I, I think part of the issue here is that, you know, with everything, critical theory has infected our brains. And this is just another example of how critical in theory it has infected us in, in almost every level. And, and the way critical theory works is that the world's divided up in the oppressor and oppressed classes. And then that's carried over into how we even understand women. So uh, women in our society are viewed as marginalized and protected classes, despite the fact that they're actually the majority of people in the world, right? <laughs> it's, uh-huh. uh, there's more women than men, so they're not actually a minority group, but then they're viewed as a pr- protected class. And, and and part of what that means is that anytime you talk about a woman being held responsible for her actions in almost any way, everyone is trained you know, automatically to kind of cringe and to think, oh, you know. You're not really allowed to talk about that. Like, That's taboo. Like, it is. I mean, it really is. And, and I mean, it's a very strange thing. And it's, um, but but it's a very obvious thing when you open your eyes and look and you see, hey, what's actually happening? Anytime a you know a man, like I'm a man, and I'm, and you're asking me as a man, like a question, you know, should women be put to death for murder? And it's like, well, you know, like instantaneously, I'm viewed as a member of the you know oppressor class. Uh, and then, you know, and me even answering the question, it's like I'm exercising patriarchal dominance over women and, you know, reabusing them by my words, you know. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's really kind of absurd when you think about it, but then everyone's playing by this playbook whether they realize it or not. And that's why everyone cringes and that's why everyone thinks like, oh, you're not allowed to go there. But then part of the strategy has been to view women in that kind of way. And part, you know, part of that is coming from – um I think the reason why I put it this way, I think the reason why Christians kind of thoughtlessly fall into this kind of rhetoric is because we do realize that it, you know, it takes two to have a baby, right? Right. And so you think to yourself, well, there there obviously is some man involved in that equation somewhere. Where is he at, you know? Um and everything else. And so then um you know, when when Eve eats of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and Adam eat of it, Adam's someone held fundamentally responsible in a more primary way. And I think that, you know, for those kind of reasons that uh, Christians just kind of thoughtlessly attach themselves onto this strategy, which really is doing a lot more than that and essentially removing all moral accountability for women, uh, period, you know, and, and, and dramatically oversimplifying, you know, what's actually happening here on the ground. But um, all other things being equal, it's um, it's not true that you know every uh, uh, part of the rhetoric has been to basically paint the, uh, women in this scenario as victims, um, and and in in a pretty thoughtless way. I mean, it's almost you say, hey, you know, abortion's murder, and it's like, well, you know, what's a woman supposed to do if she gets raped or you know 
incest and those kind of situations. And it's like, yeah, well, that's a very small percent of what we're talking about, but that isn't relevant, you know, to the moral question behind it, period. And so uh, put all that together and, and basically just the idea, though, is that the Bible says that, um, uh, you know, over and over and over again that the individual who takes another's life is going to be guilty of uh, bloodshed and the punishment for that is always in the Bible murder. So if this is a baby, if this is a human being and a woman is seeking to actively end their life, you know, it generally speaking, it doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't matter who pulls the trigger. I mean, if she hires a hit man to do it, she's involved in the same act. And, and so, yes, she should be punished for it. Um, so obviously there's going to be, you, you've already mentioned this, there's going to be, a lot of people who don't listen very well to what you're saying and they're just going to throw out the generic um, accusations against you that they always try to use to drown out any kind of thought out response uh, to what they're pushing. Um, and so I want to give you the opportunity uh, to prove them wrong. Basically they're going to say that, well, you just, you just care about punishing the woman. You just hate women. You know, those, those types of arguments are often brought up and I'm sure that people listening who are for abortion will think those things about you and I as well. So I want to give you the opportunity um, to maybe dispel some of their arguments, whether, whether they listen or not is another topic altogether. But um, what do you, you know, you, you talked, you talked a little bit about, yeah, the women, they're responsible, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if they're the ones actually doing it or not. They are responsible. So, um, so that's clear. But then, you know, what about, what about the, the doctors who are, um, who are actually killing the babies while they're still in the womb? And, you know, obviously, like, like we said, it takes two people to make a baby, Right. Normal, you know, normally it takes two people to make a baby. So, so what, what kind of punishment, um, should the, should the father face as well when it comes to abortion? So what, what punishment should the doctors face? What kind of punishment should the father face? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, you, you started by saying, Hey, you know, people will hear this as an attack on women. And the, the issue is not, I mean, Let's try to do both parts of that. So is it an attack on women? And then what about the other people involved, right? Right. So with the is it an attack on women kind of thing, what's funny about that is you, it's it's like, well, abortion is obviously an attack on women. <laughs> Think about it, you know. <laughs> like I'm the one saying we should quit killing, you know, women. Right, right. Yeah. So – I, I, I I don't mean to hijack everything you're about to say and throw off your train of thought, but I, I did see a um, tweet from, I think maybe it was Hillary Clinton um, uh -huh. who said, who, you know, was saying, Hey, we want to protect uh, the rights of our granddaughters. And she was talking about that in the context of abortion to get an abortion, you know? And, and I just, I just had to laugh at that because, because, what she was saying was actual insanity. You know, hey, we need to yeah. pr we need to protect our rights to kill our granddaughters so that our granddaughters will have rights. <laughs> like, how does that? Well, make I know, any and sense? this was funny. I mean, this was funny about the whole discussion because it's happening on that level, but then it's also happening with the race discussion. I mean, Margaret Sanger's project was to put Planned Parenthoods in the ghettos, you know, so that they could kill off the kill off as many black people as they possibly can, right? And then right. abortion is seen as like a civil rights issue. You have to have the right to get an abortion because you wouldn't want to bring a child into poverty and everything else. But then it's like, um, you know, if you care about black people, you're going to vote Democrat. But then the problem is if you care about black people, you're going to want to stop abortion, right? And who's trying to do that? The Republicans, <laughs> at least <laughs> they say they're trying to do that. But uh, you wonder if they're <laughs> as committed to it as they say. Yeah. But 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 the issue, though, is it's just like, hey, yeah, I, I want to protect the rights of black people to be alive, right, to be born. And I want to protect the rights of women to be born and not to be murdered by their uh, bloodthirsty mothers, right? So mm -hmm. 
so which like the issue is it's not like um which it's which women are you going to support right and and i want to support the ones who are uh, just wanting to be alive not the ones who are trying to kill other people so so it's not whether you care about women it's just um like if you do care about women then you probably want to keep them from being ripped apart in their mother's womb like that's the point <laughs> so seems like I at care. least a good starting point <laughs> yes i i care about them like uh and they've not done anything worthy of being ripped apart you know uh so i would rather protect them you know from um their moms you know mm-hmm. who are not being very motherly like to them so there's that but then you know then the question what should happen to the other people what and i just i think it's um it all depends on the scenario. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, whatever you're talking – like, here's the thing. It's just like I think the pro-life rhetoric has been, hey, let's criminalize abortion. Let's go after the doctors or whatever. Um, well, pro-life is often not even going after the doctors, and it's more just let's try to, you know, make it safe and legal and rare – or make it legal and rare – you know, or have some kind of heartbeat bills or whatever else. But I mean, I think at, at the strongest, the pro life movement was like, okay, let's penalize the doctors. And I say, hey, yeah, I mean, you know, it, like whoever the doctor are, whether that's a woman doctor or a man doctor, whatever we're saying related to the woman, that should be happening to them too, right? I mean, I think, um, you know, abortionists are, you know, on the level of evil as Hitler when it comes right down to it. And mm-hmm. I mean, just like, Someone like, um, you know, Hermit uh, Gosnell or whatever that guy's name was, who has jars of baby parts inside of his, you know, uh, lab or whatever. I mean, you, you like you you are. Um, I, I don't know. There's a special place in hell for abortion doctors, and the ones who wake up and actually repent of it are are the, are the individuals who are the most. I would say that they're culpable even to a greater degree sure right they're the ones mm-hmm. cutting them apart and, and i mean there's no you know i think that there is a category particularly in the past of a woman who could be deceived into thinking oh it's just a clump of tissue and cells and everything else it's not a person i think as technology is progressing that kind of thing is like um less um reasonable but i do think that these doctors are certainly uh preying upon people and filling their head full of lies but i think those lies have to kind of be willfully believed you know Mm -hmm. uh, particularly at this point to where it's not just uh, some you know um it's not just a simple scenario as far as that goes but um certainly yeah i think the doctor the one doing chopping the baby up like whatever is said what you know capital punishment applies to them too now, with the men involved in their life, I mean, I'm I'm sure that there are scenarios um, like that's that's more complicated. It's just more complicated because there's there's all there's scenarios all across the spectrum, right? So you know, in the case where the man rapes the woman, which is less than one percent of a por- uh, of uh, reported cases, sure, I mean, I, um, that is. Um, a gross sin equally deserving of condemnation, okay? Uh, In a scenario where a man is pressuring the woman to go get the abortion, he's in on it too. Everything we've said about the woman applies to him, right? Mm -hmm. So in that scenario, I'm sure, but I'm also sure that there's been plenty of scenarios where, like, the woman gets pregnant, she doesn't want to have a baby right now because it'd mess up her career and she doesn't even tell the guy that she's getting an abortion so i don't know what to tell you at that point if they're married and she hides it from him and everything else like it's not as if he even knows at that point right and so like that like that is a scenario that is real that has happened that's not uncommon so you know what scenario are we talking about and we can't just you know pretend like that kind of thing never happens either right Mm-hmm. So if if you're talking about, you know, a guy getting a woman pregnant out of wedlock um, and, you know, putting her putting her in a bad situation where she feels like there's no way out of it and that's where she goes, that still isn't the right response. Did he know about it? Did he pressure her? Is he involved in it? 
you know, if, if, if in any sense he's pressuring her and he's refusing to take care of the baby, then I would say, um, um, like if he's pressuring, whatever man, man is pressuring her to get an abortion is, you know, basically doing the moral equivalent of taking out a hit on the baby's life. Does that make sense? Right. And so, but if he's not pressuring her to get it and she's doing it against his will and against his wishes, then that's on her, you know, that's on her and the doctor. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So basically whenever an abortion happens, it's not just, uh, grab a rope and find a tree. It's, you know, grab two, maybe three ropes and find a tree. Well, yeah, depending on who's involved. I mean, I, you know, when I was doing uh, sidewalk counseling, I, I, um, it was interesting because I, it's one of those um, ministries that doesn't bear a lot of fruit, um, and you know, we're kind of encouraged to not speak in moral condemnation kind of categories and that kind of stuff. But I didn't really listen to that kind of thing. But <laughs> I remember there was an African American. <laughs> I remember there was an African American lady who was taking her fifteen-year-old daughter. Uh, I, I'm guessing her age, but she's, you know, 13 to 15 kind of years old, some, something like that. And not I, all the ladies were that age, but so, I mean, and that's, that's not what was happening, but, uh, on, as far as I could see on any, like as a frequent thing, but this one was, and she was taking her daughter in to get an abortion or, and I, I mean, I looked at the girl, I didn't even look at the mom. I said, Hey, you know, your mom doesn't love you is what I said. I said, your mom doesn't love you. If she, if she was loved that, you. Hey, was that on your, your script that they gave you? No, nah, it wasn't on my, <laughs> it wasn't on my script. <laughs> this page was two. shaming the victim. Page hey, two. I was shaming the victim here and blaming the, you know, uh, I guess what I was doing. But I looked at her and I said, hey, you know, your mom doesn't love you. Because you only have like about 15 seconds to kind of mm-hmm. talk to these people as they hurriedly rush past you into the clinic. And you have like these escorts up there who are going to, you know. Do that, but I mean, I looked at her and I said, "Hey, your mom doesn't love you." I said, "If she loved you, she wouldn't take you to this place uh, where they're going to go and kill your baby. You know, if she loved you, she would protect you from this. Like you're going to have to deal with this for the rest of your life, and you're never going to be able to forget it, that you killed your child. And if she loved you and if she cared about you, she would take you as far away from here as she possibly could. But she doesn't. She only cares about herself and how this is going to make her look. And that's what I said." But then uh, what what was interesting was she looked at me like with this look of like disgust, the mother, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was disgust. It was more just like, you know, how dare you, white boy, say this to me or something like that. (laughs) But she like, she grabbed her, like she she grabbed her daughter like uh, with her right, you know, right hand and pulled her close to her. And she turned around and she walked the other way, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and I, and I'll tell you that that was like one of the only times I ever saw a mother walk away, but mm-hmm. you know, you're supposed to not say things like that, but I hope, I don't know what happened from there. I hope she didn't just come back later, you know? Right. But, but you know, that was the only time I ever saw a mother walk away, you know, I, I, that's the only time I saw, I mean, one of the only times I've ever seen a person really walk away. Right, but it was, but um, but that's right though, you know, like that's that's right. If she loved her, she wouldn't have been there. But how did I get there? Um, what was the question again? Um, we were asking, uh, you know, what is the? We were talking about what's the punishment, you know, for the for the doctor, for the guy involved, and you had been explaining that you know it's complicated. Uh, it depend especially for the guy involved it kind of depends um uh it kind of depends on what really happened and were they pressuring the person um to get an abortion did they know about the abortion and, and i think you're specifically talking at this point about uh uh pressuring the yeah well, she was clearly, i mean that girl happen. was the young girl is clearly being p- pressured by her mother but you know and i and i think her mother at that point, when you call her on it, you know, maybe it woke her up a little bit. But yeah. you, whatever you're, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to view everyone in some simplistic category as if they're a victim, essentially, right? 
So everyone is just, uh, you know, the 13 year old girl being pressured. And certainly that happens. And, uh, in those kind of cases, and certainly the people who are pressuring are, are involved in the process, you know, sure, you know. So, you know, with that kind of mother, yeah, she she is um, conspiring to commit murder, and she's guilty of that too. And, and, you know, if the guy behind the scenes, whoever the guy is, is conspiring to commit murder, sure, you know, whatever he's seeking to do to this child, he sh- should be done to him. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but there's no simplicity. It's not as if every scenario is exactly the same in a, in, in that kind of way. Uh, but the real offensive thing is to say the woman is like to be held any with any moral responsibility for anything, and the poor life movement hasn't wanted to do that, you know, because they're basically afraid of the feminist. Yeah, and so <laughs> <laughs> so let's just like, the, the strategy has been just accept basically the the premise that all men are just you know abusers and rapists and you know by definition of them having power you know essentially and that the women are the innocent victims and like let's not like go there and speak on those terms but and the problem with that is that you remove like here's the problem is like when you do that everyone knows that it's not a serious argument you're making at that point right do you see what i'm saying uh, exp- explain like if, a, explain a little bit. Well, like if you refuse to like, tr- like, is it murder or not? If we're saying it's murder, then why aren't we treating them as if they commit murder? Right. And if you don't treat them as if you commit murder, you'll you'll forgive the pagans for thinking we don't actually believe it's murder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like if we thought it was murder, we would treat it as murder. But we, you know, if you just like, oh, well, you know, they're just an innocent victim caught up in a system that's designed to oppress them. It's just like, well, you obviously aren't. You don't actually think this is what you're saying it is. If you did, you'd have a different reaction to this. You know, mm-hmm. so let's call your bluff. You know? And and quite frankly, I I think that many Christians are they really deep down they don't think it's murder. If they did, they would handle it differently than what they do. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, the more I the more I've looked into organizations like End Abortion Now with um uh crap. What what's the name of the the guy who founded it? I'm totally blanking on him right now. Um, at apologia or i guess they call it yeah yeah Yeah. jeff jeff um the more i've i've watched a lot of their things and and really listened to um him explain a lot of their positions it really has been kind of eye-opening in terms of you know comparing guys like him to a lot of uh, a lot of the pro-life people out there especially in government right now where it's this strange like it it really doesn't make sense to say that the woman is a victim it doesn't make any sense at all like if you're if you're some person and you know you hate your brother and so you go and you hire an assassin to go kill your brother who in their right mind is going to look at that scenario and say hey look the brother's just a victim of his circumstance Right, they're gonna say that was a horrible thing that he did, and he needs to go to he needs to at least go to prison you know, for what he's done. But then people refuse to think that way when it comes to abortion. We always want uh, most pro life people always want to view the mother as just a, a poor, helpless victim who is you know being taken advantage of, and she's been forced into this position. And what else was she supposed to do? Yeah, I mean, I think it's complicated because I think it. It can be that both things can be true at the same time, mm-hmm. right? And I think that that's basically, you know, if you think about how total depravity works and just a doctrine of sin in general, all of us are victims and villains at the same time. Right. Like when you think about it. So like if you, if you think about like any sin that we commit, um, like um, just um, like lying, for instance, like – like in order to, I, I mean, people like they learn to lie based on, I mean, we don't all start out innocent. We start out like deeply flawed. Yeah. And so there's sins that are inherent to us, period. But then at the same time, we have examples of people who, uh, examples of people who take those in, inborn tendencies towards sin and give them expression, right? So, I mean, if you grow up in a family full of liars and swindlers, Sure, like, are you a victim of, you know, your upbringing? Well, yeah, sure, right? Like, you weren't, you're taught from an early age 
how to be deceitful and how to be a liar and everything else. And like, if you live in like a Jewish society in the first century, then Jesus is going to look at Nathaniel and he's going to say, Hey, you know, behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Ha ha ha. We all know that you guys are swindlers just like Jacob was right. Uh huh. <laughs> and Laban, right? <laughs> like, well, they learn that kind of thing and that becomes characteristic of a certain society. Right. But at the same time, it's like, like, are you a victim or are you a villain? Well, the answer is yes, right? Yes, yes, I'm both, right? I, so, I mean, the same thing with, like, um, you know, individuals who rape people, you know, to talk about something that um, is, you know, with the Me Too movement and everything else. It's like, you know, most people who rape other people, they were raped at an early age, right? Mm-hmm. And so, but then, like, you can't just, well, you were raped at, like, and that's how most people come to uh practice sodomy is that they had some early you know sexual encounter with an older man early on in their life and it's like well yeah i mean you were a victim and now you have transitioned at some point in your life into a perpetrator Mm -hmm. that's the way it works right and so the same thing's true of even like the 13 year old girl the 14 year old girl who is just forced into this and just i mean in, in most you know scenarios no matter what you tell yourself like there is like some sort of knowledge that you're killing your baby and your parents are telling you you have to and you have to, but you're not objecting too strongly because you want it all to go away too, right? right. So it's not just sim- it's not just simple like um, like you're a victim, you're a villain. And I think that the, a lot of these discussions just go on the, along those lines of, well, either they're full villain or they're full victim. And it's like, hey, yeah, maybe they're a little bit of both, you know? Like maybe they're yeah, like, okay, like let's take a scenario where – you know, a woman is sleeping around with a man uh, who the, she's not married to. She's, you know, 19 years old. They're in college. You know, both of them had too much to drink and whatever else. And they're uh, engaged in consensual sex, whatever. Right. Well, what, what? And then she gets pregnant and she doesn't tell the guy about it. And then she goes and has an abortion. All right. Was she vic- victimized? Right. Well, uh, Yes, to some degree, is she a villain? Yes, you know. So, mm-hmm. like, it's not it's not as simple. So, like, whose fault was it that they slept around? Uh, they they both had you know intercourse. Well, isn't it both of their fault? They're both drunk. Who's who's you know who 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 do you blame? Well, if you're a feminist, you say, well, the man was the rapist because you know he shouldn't have had sex with her when she was drunk. It's like, well, she was drunk and he was drunk. They're both drunk. Like, whose fault is it? Both their faults, right? Does a man bear more responsibility because God is going to? Look at him. Sure, maybe, right? But at the same time, they're both involved in that. She got pregnant. He didn't even know that she was, you know, he might not have even known in that scenario she was pregnant. Now she goes and gets an abortion. Well, if he had respect and he wouldn't have got her, you know, he wouldn't have been drinking with her knowing that that's the kind of thing. If she was, uh, you know, resisted the urge to drink and it wasn't, you know, coerced drinking or something like that. Like both of them bear some moral responsibility for this inevitable for this outcome, right? To some degree, but then they're both victims. They're both villains in a certain sense. Like he's a victim in that she killed his child without knowing about it. She's a vic- she's a victim in that he had sex with her before wedlock, right? Mm-hmm. Like and so it's just I, I think you know these scenarios are typically pretty complicated and like just waving a victim universal victim flag over anyone is just probably not, doesn't fit the vast majority of situations mm-hmm. when it comes down to it. But then, I mean, I think the opposite is true too. I mean, it may just be that waving a, your universal villain over it is not is maybe an oversimplification, but I mean, at the end of the day, here's the thing. I mean, it's just like, if we are talking about murder, if that's what we're talking about, you know, it doesn't matter all the things that preceded to it, uh, up to it, it's still wrong, Right. And that's, that's the point. And, you know, I mean, I get tired of like looking at all the pro-life tweets or whatever out there who, you know, 13 year old girl, uh, bravely decides to have her baby, you know, uh, despite the fact that she's 13 and blah, 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 blah. It's like, that isn't an act of bravery. <laughs> it's not like, that's just called not being Hitler. Right. Uh-huh. Like, why did we lower the standard? <laughs> like, I'm glad she had the baby, but I mean, don't act like it's bravery to not like rip your baby in shreds. Yeah, because it was ha- you had it at an inconvenient time. I mean, like, come on, you know, like this isn't bravery. This is called just being a decent human being. Yeah, you know? this can't be the ceiling. This needs to be the floor. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, yeah, d- yes. You know, 
thank you for not murder savagely murdering someone. Like, okay, you know, but whatever that is, that's not virtuous. That's just <laughs> mm-hmm. that that's something else, right? But then I think we surrender the whole argument when we, you know, even think in those terms. But mm-hmm. anyways, what else you got? Um, so this this might feel kind of like a stupid question at this point, but I feel like we need to take some time to talk about it. Uh, so, you know, I, I mean, we're, we've been saying, Hey, this is wrong. This is bad. This is, uh, this is murder, whatever else. So is there any like, um, scripture that can help us when it comes to abortion specifically to help explain for those who don't understand, um, how it could be anything other than, a you know, a women's right issue, that that might help them some scripture that that might kind of speak to what we're talking about. Oh sure, I mean I, I think the classic passage that most people go to is Psalm one thirty nine thirteen, which basically says, "For you, God, for you formed my inward parts, and you knitted me together in my mother's womb." Right. So mm-hmm. notice how it says, "You knitted me together in my mother's womb," meaning um, that essentially uh, there is a person, you know. Who is being formed, David, who is being formed, and he exists as a person while he's still within his mother's womb, right? Uh, that's one of the ways that you go to talk about establishing abortion as being murder is that you appeal to passages like that. But then also within the law, I mean, um, you know, if a man um, uh, basically um, harms a woman and her uh, – unborn child within her you know it's it, it, like let's say he harms her to such a degree that the unborn child is killed within her he's going to be put to death for that and so the bible considers the unborn child a human being it doesn't consider the unborn child just some um thing you know he will be avenged life for life you know eye for eye tooth for tooth life for life and and that's applied the lex talionis principles applied to the unborn baby even so from a biblical perspective, God's the one who's knitting the baby together. This is considered a baby. Um, it's, it, you know, you, um, if, if you are involved in terminating that, you're going to be put to death, biblically speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's funny. It's funny that you bring up the, the passage about um, the man, if a man accidentally kills an unborn unborn baby i think it's essentially like if two men begin to fight and right and uh in the chaos of the moment there's a you know there's a pregnant woman nearby and and she gets struck or something and and it kills the unborn baby then the man needs to be put to death it's funny you mentioned that because i actually had someone uh try to tell me that that exact passage is actually arguing for abortion um and and it it you know, it was it was an idiotic arg- argument um, where the person was basically. I, I don't know if they just didn't understand what the passage was saying, or if they were trying to be dishonest uh, in the in what the passage was saying and try to deceive people. But I mean, it's a it's a pretty clear passage that say saying there is life in the womb, and when it is terminated, when it is killed, then there's a a penalty. That must be paid, and that's what the the Israelites were held to, um, uh, not you know not not the other way around. Where if if something happens to the unborn baby, then you know, oh well, big deal. It wasn't a human, so we're not going to kill someone over it. Um, so it, yeah, so it's Exodus twenty one twenty two through twenty five. It says, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman, so her children come out. But there is no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fined. That's the woman's husband shall oppose on him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. But if there's harm, he shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, right. stripe by stripe. I think what he, when you t- told me about that, I think he was reading it in the King James, and the King James, he was making a poor assumption about mm-hmm. it based on that or something like that. Let's see, what does the King James say? It says... Uh, um, let's see. I can pull it up. Um, uh, if men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, 
and yet no mischief follow. <laughs> he shall surely be punished according to to uh, court lay upon him, and he shall pay his judge. If any mischief follows, then thou shalt give life for life. I can't remember what I can't remember what his argument was. It's been a while, but I think he was uh, something about the fruit uh, depart or something along uh-huh. those lines. But <laughs> it, but a, I, I think that's a clear passage, though, that is definitely saying you know. If um, no harm, then no foul, right? You right. Pay a fine. There's a fine. Yeah, uh, but if, if the fruit depart, if the you know miscarriage happens, it's life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, stripe for stripe. Right. But, I mean, there's a lot of um, uh, Jeremiah twenty seventeen because he did not kill me before birth, so that my mother would have been my grave and her womb ever pregnant. He's just lamenting that God didn't kill him before his birth, mm-hmm. like meaning he was alive. <laughs> right. <laughs> He was, and he was a person. Like, he was a person. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like you, you can even think about the, um, you know, the children not being born yet in Romans nine, Jacob and Esau, being, right? Not being born, they were in their mother's womb. Not being the born, forbidden chapter. Not, yeah, not even uh, they um, um, haven't even done evil or good yet, you know. But um, God made a choice. In, even in that condition, but like there's, I mean, I think there's so many passages like this that could come to mind. I, and just, that's just a few that instantaneously kind of come to mind. Mm-hmm. But, um, um, but yeah. Uh, so not only, Oh, sorry. Keep going. Keep going. Well, you know, like John the Baptist leaping in, you know, his mother's womb kind of mm-hmm. thing too. You know, there's just so mm-hmm. many, I, I can't say more, but. Um, so obviously there's a lot of uh, scripture that, you know where God tells us uh, babies who are unborn they're still in their mother's womb they're still babies they're still people they're human beings made in God's image and God has told us um, to uh, unjustly uh, take life from another human being made in the image of God is wrong and evil and sinful but then you know not only does the Bible tell us this, but obviously science also um, tells us a similar thing. You know, it's the same genetic code um, that, that the fetus has uh, compared to us, you know, they're, they're obviously still developing, but then uh, in definitional terms, they're still a human being, right? Uh, It's not a matter of they will one day be a human being. It's, they are actually right now from the moment of conception a human being. And so so in one sense, when it when we're having this discussion and we're talking about people who are um, pro baby murder, who are pro abortion, um, it seems like not only to to take this position, not only do you have to deny the Bible, do you have to deny scripture, but you also have to deny uh you know, modern science and really just common sense too. Uh, but then, you know, you hear uh, from Democrats and progressives a lot of times. You 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 hear a lot uh, the term being thrown around. You know, science denier, uh, especially as it relates to COVID and and um, the the right's response to COVID, essentially asserting, hey. You guys are denying the science. You're denying the science. If you had just believed the science, you would come to the same conclusions we're coming to, uh, which is funny and ironic because while they're while they're making that claim, they are actually the ones who are denying clear science, uh, much more clear than the COVID stuff right now, much more clear. And they're denying it, but then no one, no one's really coming out and saying, "Hey, y'all are y'all are a bunch of science deniers, y'all are y'all are a bunch of lunatics," you know. Um, so, so why do you think, uh, why do you think that's the case? That um, while while it's happening, they're denying science. No one's actually coming out and saying, "Hey, you're denying, you're the science denier." So. Maybe stop. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, but that's happening in almost every single level. And I think uh, 
I think that's part of the reason why. Um, like one of the things that just let me change the subject for a second in order to answer the question, but um, just to give you some, I mean, just to give some examples of what you're talking about. But I remember with the 2020 election, it was very funny because it was like um, uh, for you know basically um, it, it, from 2016 to 2020, you basically had. Um, a group of people like on the left who were just screaming and just refusing whatsoever to accept the results of the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had the media, you had everyone is just refusing to accept the results of this 2016 election. I've never seen a meltdown on the left so much uh, as with that, the the aftermath of that. I mean, when Trump was elected, it was like, I knew he was going to get elected because I saw, you know, where things were headed. But then when he was elected, you could just like you could see these people who were just their world was shattered, you know, and they didn't even know how to like do life anymore. And yeah, just, I remember the video broke. of the girl screaming no at the <laughs> inauguration. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, it was just, it was one of those humorous things where you just see people just like utterly unable to see reality at that point. But you know, for, for four years, you know, for four years, it was just like you know. That you see a group of people not accepting the outcome of an election. But then, you know, leading up to the 2020 election, the, I mean, over and over and over again, if you remember what happened in the news, they kept on saying over and over and over again, like, um, you know, Trump, if you lose, will you accept the outcome of the election, right? You know, and Trump is going to, you know, stage a coup and he's not going to leave office and he's just going to do all this stuff. And it's just like, wh what in the world is going on here, you know? Like what in the world is going? Like what? What makes you think he's not going to accept the outcome of an election, right? Mm -hmm. Like what? What makes you think that he's like you guys are the ones who've been doing this for four years, you know? But then, almost at every point. So you remember like the Russian collusion hoax? Yeah. Like so, they did that the whole time. Like the left did that the whole time. This Russian collusion hoax, and then it turns out that oh, maybe that was Hillary Clinton who was in bed with the Russians <laughs> and everything else. But then you hear about it, and and one of the things I bring those kind of things up just to say that it was really startling. It was really remarkable to me to watch this thing happen because in case after case after case, it seems to me that on the left, what's happening is everything they're accusing the right of doing. That's what they're doing themselves. Right? right. So it I almost and it's painfully it's obvious like, too. It's pain. It's painfully obvious. So I mean, think about like the science denier myth kind of stuff, right? What's well, like you Christians, you're science deniers. It's like, well, look, um, I know that there's a kind of you know ignorant Christian out there who is you know anti all science and, and probably for good reason because science has clowned themselves at, uh, to such a degree. But like, think about like the areas of life that are out there right now that are under dispute so we're told like all all of science right now is pointing to the reality that you're like it, the, the world is increasingly complex right mm -hmm. so i mean that's what science like it's irreducibly complex like meaning like um like ir to say something's irreducibly complex it's like you're talking about a mousetrap so uh analogy so if you think about a mousetrap every single component to a mousetrap is necessary for it to be a mouse trap. You have to have the base. You have to have the spring. You have to have the, you know, the um, pressure plate, the lever, pressure plate. You have to have all that. You take any part of it away, it ceases to function in any meaningful way. And you look at the world; it's kind of like that. And so, there's no way to like gradually evolve into a mouse trap, right? Yet you need each part. It's irreducibly complex. Now, one of the things that Darwin said was like, if you want to d disprove my theory, you have to show that the world is essentially, he didn't use this phrase, but this is what he was saying. You have to show that the world is irreducibly complex. And and as science keeps on rolling in, we see, oh, it's way more complex. Now, now what we can see, like it's way more complex than they thought, right? Like the very thing that there's, would disprove this idea of in, uh, of uh, random blind chance having uh, evolved, you know, things evolving from simple things into complex is to show how complex it actually is. Well, that's we have the science to show that now, and yet we're not ab abandoning that theory. Uh, you know, with all the COVID masking stuff, we've had like study after study after study showing that masks are ineffective for respiratory viruses for years. We had all of these, then COVID comes up and we throw all, all, all that out the door. And mm -hmm. now, I mean, even Fauci at the beginning of the thing told us that <laughs> masks don't work, so don't go buy them. Then it became a political talking point. And now we need two. And and everyone knows that, hey, like this isn't like a spacesuit, you know, like air comes through these things, right? And like viruses are, 
just like throwing a baby through a tennis racket. It's not going to work, you know? We, we understand, like, the virus, that respiratory virus is the size of them pretty small, you know? And so mm-hmm. we, we know that. But, like, so, but then we're, we're called the science deniers uh, as far as that goes. If you say, hey, you know, maybe these masks don't work, you know? Um, like you're saying that they're going to work uh, because they're obviously don't have a self-contained oxygen unit within them. They're just a piece of cloth, you know? Uh, so, but then, you know, think about the transgender nonsense. Like if there's anything that settled science at this point, like just think about like what, what is actually settled science is that male and female are different. They have different chromosomes. We can look at their, like their genetics and we can see <laughs> X, Y, X, X, you know, like this is different, you know, like, uh, their DNA, like their, their very body composition points to it. So it seems to me that almost at every single point, uh, the point of this is just to say at almost every single point, the left is doing what they're accusing us of. And so they're saying, hey, we're science deniers. It's like, hey, I think the science actually backs up the fact that God made them male and female. Uh, the science backs up, up the fact that we're made irreducibly complex. We didn't you know, evolve from simple life forms. There's nothing in like that isn't the way that actually things work. The, the science backs up the fact that, you know, in this case that, I mean, you can do an ultrasound. We have 3D ultrasounds to see that this is a baby. We know that they're, the babies feel pain. You can look at ultrasounds as this baby is being ripped apart and seeing it jerk away violently from the knife that's like cutting its limbs apart, uh, or the you know the puncture that's sucking its vac- vacuuming, sucking its brains out so that it can its head can fit through the birth canal. We we can see what's actually happening here. We have vivid pictures of what's happening. That we see babies that are being born alive who are being killed, you know, being scalped and having their, you know, scalps put on mice. Like we, we have the technology now to show what we've all known for years and what every mother knows, right? And that's what's so absurd about it. Like, honestly, it was so absurd about it is that, you know, women know, women know, like, that's why they cry. You, know, you can have a woman who's pregnant for, you know, a few weeks and she has a miscarriage and she cries and it's like, why are you crying? You know, that's just a clump of cells, right? She knows what it is. Right. She knows it's a baby, you know, and that's why she cries. And, and, and you know, the women who get abortion, they can tell themselves this all day long, but they know. And that's the point. Like, they know if you loved them and cared about them, you wouldn't try to validate this delusion because they know they killed their baby. And and they have a natural intuition to know what, what you know, science shows us and confirms. They, they, have, they have the intuition to know what they're doing. No, and and then and that's why they you know there's no recovering from it really. I'll never forget. Um, I'll never forget when all of the riots were going on. Um, I guess in the summer of 2020. Now, man, it's almost 2022. Um, in in the summer of 2020, when all those riots were going on, I remember seeing an article at some point about uh, some some woman who was out during these riots and she got hit and I think, I guess the stomach with a um, bean bag from a police bean bag rifle and, Mm -hmm. and everyone was making a big deal out of this. And, and I don't, I don't really remember um, what the outcome of it was in terms of, you know, was the, was the lady all right and was the baby all right? I can't remember. Um, I really hope that they were both fine, but, but I remember people making such a huge deal out of it and look at how brutal the police are and, and whatnot. And I, I remember, you know, thinking while I was reading that this is a really strange argument to make if you're pro abortion, you know, to use this as an example of, of violence, you know, because, because essentially what was happening is um, they were using it as like a, look, you can't, you can't hurt pregnant people like especially if there's anyone you don't hurt it's pregnant people and and um you know if something were to happen this would be in it like this would be uh this is essentially a much higher stake situation if there were damage to be done than to a normal you know lady who's not pregnant and i remember thinking like well why if your whole stance is that it's just a clump of cells then why you know well, yeah, and I think that's where it's just so, um, like the whole, um, like the the idea of choice now in like the evolutionary framework, you know, it, it all revolves around this idea of like my, my truth, right? So when you're in like a relativistic society where they're, you know, postmodern society where there is no such thing as, as real truth, then essentially reality is what you define it to be, Right. 
So then if you want the baby, then the baby becomes a baby. Right? <laughs> <laughs> In my reality, this is a baby. <laughs> this is my truth, my truth, right? And so everything is you know, up to the subjective whim of the individual. If you are a man who thinks you're a woman, you want to be a woman, right? Well, the very act of desiring to be is real. If it's real to you, then it's real, right? And that's where it's just like you look at it on the outside, and if you're looking at it through the lens of, hey, there is an objective truth, it's nonsense. But then to these kind of people, the, the reason why they can't see it is because reality is determined by their whims at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. And they could you know, change those whims at any moment, and then you're guilty of crime <laughs> as far as that goes. But um, – you know, so it's you know, the, it's my body, my choice, right? So if if I decide that I want this baby, it becomes a baby. If I don't want it, it is a clump of cells. You know, it's all up to me and how I wish to define it, right? Mm -hmm. But surely, yeah, uh, there, there's no objective basis for any law that can be you know imposed at that point. Yeah, um, I think so. Right now, we're at I think about the one hour mark. And I have a lot more questions that I want to ask you, Tim, about this. Um, do you want? Do you want to? Do you want to do a part two on should women who murder their unborn children be drawn and quartered? Um, do you feel like that would be helpful? Yeah, we could. Uh, we could do people? another week. That's fine. Okay. Uh, well, I want to. I want to ask you one more question, and this actually isn't one. Um, that I had on my script. So I'm, I'm going off script here a little bit, but I, I, I've been thinking about this as I've been listening to you. And I think it might be helpful just to hear um, your reasoning behind why you're doing this. As we've been talking, as we've been having this discussion, uh, you know, you haven't really, you haven't really shied away from being very descriptive in terms of what's happening. So for example, earlier when we were talking about um, you, you were talking about the response that, you know, babies have uh, in terms of when, when the doctor is performing the abortion, you know, he's sticking the, he's sticking the knife in, he's vacuuming out the brain, um, you know, ripping, ripping the arms and the legs off of the baby while it's, while it's still alive. You've not, you've not really shied away from, um, from describing these these things in detail and and i want to know um is that is that purposeful are you i mean I, whenever i've heard pro-life people in general you know uh talk about abortion I've, I've never really heard people um explain in detail what's going on and, and use that as part of their argument it seems like normally they try to shy away from all of the details of abortion i guess because Maybe it's too grotesque or, or it's taboo or something. I'm not really sure, but, but is that personal? I mean, personal. Is that purposeful on your end in terms of describing what is actually happening uh, when, when someone gets an abortion? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I know the pro-life movement is, it pretty much discourages that sort of thing. Um, in a pretty comprehensive way. I mean, there, it's, it's, uh, there's obviously, um, you know, the pro-life movement, it's not like a monolith or whatever, but there's clear kind of structure and organization. And one of the things that they discourage is being overly graphic and that kind of thing. And and, and one of the things that they, uh, I, th I think, you know, showing the pictures of the baby and that kind of stuff and showing the pictures of, uh, of like uh, the pile of baby body parts on the table, you know, next to the syringes, uh, next to the scalpels and stuff like that. They typically uh, discourage that kind of thing. And I think the people who are more on the abolitionist end of things are more graphic as far as that goes. And there's a whole discussion about abolitionism versus incrementalism as it relates to that thing that uh, probably needs its own le uh, own episode or whatever. Right. But um in general, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really looking at it like as a pro-life leader or something like that. I'm just looking at it as a Christian. And I mean, I know that there's plenty of people in Nazi Germany during the Holocaust that uh, basically are just trying to pretend like they don't know what's happening, right? 
Mm-hmm. So I mean, human be. I know. I know just based on um, my studied scripture and counseling background that people, you know, have a great capacity sort towards self deception. And if something's out of sight, it's kind of out of mind. And abortion is one of those things where I think for the vast majority of people, we um, we don't we, we just want to pretend like it's not happening, right? Yeah. In the same way, we want to pretend like we don't know what is happening to the. You know, the uh, train full of Jews headed to Auschwitz with the smokestacks and everything else. It's like you keep your head down, mind your own business, don't worry about it. And if you do that, then you kind of uh, don't feel any imperative to really do much as far as that goes. You can just pretend like, hey, you know, out of sight, out of mind. You're like the ostrich who's sticking your head in the sand and hoping, you know, everything goes away, right? Mm-hmm. And so in, in my mind, like the issue is um, – this is a moral issue. We're ripping babies up in their mother's womb. Um, and it's a pretty gruesome procedure. And, um, I think, um, I think, you know, the subject itself is kind of clouded in, in terms of our use of euphemisms, like, you know, abortion and that kind of stuff and, uh, fetus language and everything else. Um, I think we try to do everything we can to soften the blow. And I think essentially that's what the pro-life movement is trying to do is to do everything they can to soften the the moral issues that are at play in order to gain some sort of consensus. Uh, But then the problem is it's just like I I think you're starting with a faulty framework, right? And so I think what the pro-life movement is failing to do is they're failing to speak to this as a moral issue, and so they're, they're, they're stripping all their language and their tools, uh, like they're stripping all the moral issues involved. Because, I mean, the truth is, is like if this is it, like, you know, it, <laughs> these are babies that are being like ripped up. And like if you, uh, you know, you only have to, all you have to do is watch an ultrasound of it happening and you'll probably be scarred for life, you know, mm-hmm. and can't get it out of your brain. And the point, though, is just to say that that's um, – like there's a type of like I think I don't think the right response is to try to hide people from this, uh, but then the problem is is if you do that, then like you force people to draw sides, you know, in a very clear way. Because I mean, when when it comes right down to it, like this, like the, the abortionists, like like if, if if people understand what's actually happening, they'll understand that these abortionists are you know worse than Nazis, mm-hmm. and like they're you know it there's a you know, you're going to be an awful punishment waiting for them on the last day. You know, the, the worst uh, intensity of hell is going to be reserved for that kind of person who just is destroying lives. Just, I mean, I, you know, I've heard testimony of you know, former abortionists who've killed thousands of babies. They've done this thousands of times. Can you imagine what it would be like to, like, rip babies apart, like thousands of babies apart? How could you do it, you know? But we just, you know, out of sight, out of mind, we wrap it in euphemism, we pretend it's a clump of sails, you know, we're filled with a bunch of lies and they're lies that we want to know. And, and, and you know, I, I just don't, you know, I haven't adopted this kind of framework that says that in order to be loving, you lie to people. And so, you know, my moral intuition doesn't go that way. I don't think that, I think the truth will set us free and we need to be honest and truthful about what's actually happening. And that's the only hope for people. And I mean, and that's why I responded to the lady I talked about the way I did and the girl I talked about the way I did is because I feel like the truth will set us free and you know you have to speak about it in moral categories you know that's yeah. this is what you have to do yeah and I, so if you try to shelter people from that like you're not helping them to see uh, clearly yeah uh, what the actual danger is I remember um I I didn't really understand what the answer that you just gave, I didn't really understand it for a long time. And I remember at one point, I think I can't, I can't remember if K if, if, um, if my wife was, was pregnant with, um, our baby or if she had already been born. But I remember watching a video from end abortion now where it showed a, a guy who was a part of their group holding, you know, he was holding up a sign standing out on the sidewalk and the sign, um, it, it showed a, a picture of a baby who had been, um, killed in the womb. And, and it was a horrific picture. I mean, the baby, the baby's head had been crushed and, 
and um, it was covered in you know blood, mangled, um, and and its eyes were were open still, and you know obviously not sh- you know not showing any kind of life, and just kind of like a thousand yard stare type thing, um, and and below the picture the sign just said does anyone even care and i think when i saw that that was probably that was probably the the turning point for me not in terms of of you know i i was for abortion and and then all of a sudden i wasn't anymore when i saw the, that picture but more what i mean is just i i had always been against abortion i didn't think it was right but then i think when i saw that picture um that that was the point where I realized just how awful this is and just how serious um, the situation is and, and how much uh, something needs to be done about what's going on. Because, I mean, like you said, I, this is a picture of one baby, but then there's people doing this thousands of times, you know, and and so that picture that I saw has happened at this point six over 60 million times. And, um, you know, I, I just don't think any, anyone who can look at that picture and then still say, yes, we should have the right to kill our own baby in the womb. I, I just don't get it. And, um, I really, I really do see, I, I remember asking you, like why why would they show these things is this really the most helpful thing and and i remember asking you and you kind of telling me a similar response to uh what you just said and 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 I, now i'm i'm totally 100% on the same page you know we can't once you see these pictures you're forced you're forced to pick a side it's too it's too graphic um it's it's too um yeah, it's just too graphic to not have a, to not have a response to it one way or the other, and and um, you know hopefully more people um, start doing that and just start addressing the fact that this is gross and disgusting and wicked and evil, um, and that'll actually open people's eyes to the truth of the well, matter. Yeah, yeah, I think you. The the problem is that we're told, like, in order to, like, love people, essentially, you try to shelter them from right. all the harsh realities that there are in the world. And so, I mean, and that's what we're trying to do to the women is, like, in order to be loving to the women, to gain consensus, you know, you, you don't put it in the moral categories that you're doing. I mean, we're trained to lie to people at every conceivable level, right? Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, men are trained to lie to women, like we're trained to lie to, I mean, we're basically just like, you know, think about all the masking stuff. We know it doesn't work. We're told to lie to each other in order to make everyone feel better. And the same thing's happening with this kind of moral issue is that we're, we're basically, I mean, we, the church is telling people to do that, you know, and that's what mm-hmm. all the friendship evangelism kind of stuff is. Yeah. It's just like, you don't go in there and you say, Hey, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You hateful bigot. I mean, come on. Like what you do, <laughs> what you do is you try to win, you know, earn the right to be heard, be a friend first and, you know, let them know you care about them and, 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 you know, I think that there's like a lot of strategies like that are just trying to soften people from the, the harsh truth when, I mean, really, like in order for them to turn from their wicked ways, like you you have to, you know, present it as what what it is. And, and I mean, I think, um, you know, like the, the, the truth is that we're worse than Nazis and we don't even see it. You know, we're, 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 ten times, we're way worse than Nazis. You know, we're an evil, immoral reprobate society that has lost its way and and like the 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 thing is that like it's like when jesus confronted the rich young ruler you know he confronted him with the law and like that's you know when you see stephen's preaching to the jews he says you know you murdered the holy one of god and they were they gnashed their teeth and went on the attack and killed him you know Mm -hmm. and like that's what's going to happen like in our society i mean like the thing is it's just like if you speak the truth and you do so boldly, the society is going to be mad at you. You're not going to win consensus that way. But why would you want to win consensus with a bunch of Nazis? Mm-hmm. You know, why would you want to do that? 
Like, just you want the Nazis to repent and convert and no longer be Nazis. And the only way they're going to do that is if you, you know, if the guys at work and they you speak clearly about what they're doing. But I think like part of the problem is that the pro life movement is, you know, not as fully committed to the propositions that they say they are. And I think people know it, you know, and that's why, you know, plenty of your pro life people don't seem overly committed to actually ending this thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. When it comes yeah. right down to it is because like deep down, it's like, I don't know that they believe what they're saying, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so my impulse isn't really to lie to a bunch of people. It's to say, okay, let's treat it like what it is, you know? Right. Well, okay. We'll end it there and then we'll do a, a part two episode on this. Cause like I said, I still have a lot of questions that I want to ask you that I think might be helpful for um, people who are listening to us talk about this topic. But until, until uh, next week, this has been another episode of Bible Bashed. We hope you have been encouraged and blessed through our discussion. Now go boldly and obey the truth in the midst of a biblically illiterate world who will be perpetually offended by your every move. Thank you.